Hello everybody. Today I'm going to do a series of videos on my most hated of creatures, worms or helminths. Um, we're going to talk about specifically in this video, tapeworms. So when I think about tapeworms, I think about basically if you, when you were a kid and you would take a roll of scotch tape and you would pull it all out and then eventually some of it would like fold over itself um it's basically that it's like taking a really long piece of scotch tape or um ribbons um holiday season when i'm recording this you when you look at some forms of ribbon they've got like little lines those segments well that's kind of like tapeworms because tapeworms have segments um those are called proglottids so we're going to talk about tapeworms in this video the tapeworms that i'm going to talk about and just to kind of um be complete tapeworms are also known as cestodes um, they're all helminths because all worms are helminths, but in particular, tapeworms are also known as cestodes. We're going to talk about two tapeworms in this one. Um, these are the tania species, very different from tinea. Tinea is a fungal infection that causes things like ringworm and jock itch and athlete's foot. Tania are tapeworms and they can be rather large. Specifically, the tania are associated with two things Americans love to eat. Beef, like in our hamburgers, and pork, you know, like barbecue. Um, so this video is really gonna tell you about the importance of cooking your burgers and your barbecue till it's a nice, well done flavor, okay? All right, so let's get into it. All right, so first, what exactly is a tapeworm? Um, so the bodies of tapeworms, they're flat and ribbon-like. The heads are equipped, and this is where it starts getting really creepy, with organs of attachment, all right? First off, the head itself, we can't just call it a head. That's too like us, and these things are creepy and otherworldly. So we're actually gonna call this the scolex, okay? Nice and terrifying sounding. So the scolex of a tapeworm is normally associated with four muscular cup-shaped suckers. Uh, and I mean that like, like, um, like a suction cup, like something that could actually like stick to you, like your intestinal wall really bad okay so you see these suckers this is how they're actually going to hold on now some of the tapeworms don't just use suckers they also use hooks so they're literally like getting their hooks into you like fishing okay um and those will be up by the rostellum so you have hooks and you have suckers this is how they actually attach the exception of this is actually an organism that we're not going to talk about in this video, but that I'll make a separate video for, and that's Diphilobothrium latum. This is actually a fish tapeworm. The scolex in Diphilobothrium latum is actually equipped with long lateral muscular grooves. It lacks the hooklets altogether, okay? Now, remember, I said that this was kind of like ribbon, right, where we have segments. These segments are known as proglottids. When you have a chain of segments, that's actually known as a strobola. As new proglottids develop, existing ones mature and become more and more distal. So your most immature will be found up by the scolex, and your most mature will be found toward the end of the worm. Why? The mature proglottids have basically the reproductive organs, okay? All tapeworms are hermaphroditic, one-stop shopping for reproduction. They have both male and female kind of capabilities, okay? So the more distal a proglottid is, the more it becomes almost completely occupied by a uterus that's just full of eggs, which are passed in the stools of the carrier, i.e. you or me. Ugh. All right, so all of these tapeworms, they have both of them, and each is found in a mature proglotted segment. All right, so Tania. I'm actually going to talk about it in um, one video for both of these organisms. So when I say T. solium, I'm talking about pork. When, I'm ta when I say T. saginata, I'm talking about beef, okay? The main thing that I want you to get out of this video, are you listening? This is the most important thing. If the patient has sister cercosis, sister cercosis, right here, it came from pork. It's T. solium. 
big deal, okay? Um, you may also see this referred to as neurocystocercosis. Um, and I'll go through what that clinical syndrome looks like in a minute, but that's just an important point, okay? So T. solium, that's the pork tapeworm. You know I love my infective and diagnostic stages for parasites, so let's go over them. For the infective stage of T. solium, it's the cystocerci. Cystocerci, you know I hate pronouncing these words, but anyway, it really, it's a larval worm, okay? So basically, you have this worm that's kind of, um, I'll show it to you in a better picture, it kind of looks pearl-like, but basically the worm kind of goes into like this little bladder that looks like it's covered in white and worm uh, and pearl-like, and that's why it's called a cystocerci, because it's cysted, it's encysted itself, but it's actually a worm. The diagnostic stage, egg okay so we can find the egg in the patient okay t saginata it causes a disease that's similar to cystocercosis but it's different it tends to be a little bit more mild um, than t solium um, t saginata is the beef tapeworm this one we actually do still see in the united states but t solium we don't tend to see in the united states um, t saginata again same infective stage larval worm or cystocerci T. saginata diagnostic stage, you have two options here. You can find the eggs or you can find the proglottids. So literally the individual segments of the tapeworm. Okay, so let's kind of go through the structure and how we actually get it, okay? So the larval stage or cystocircus or the bladder worm is basically what we're going to see in the tissues, okay? So in this larval stage, it has a scolex, so it has a head, which is basically invaginated into a fluid-like bladder. And that's what I was trying to describe on the last slide. These two things that look like pearls, this is actually cystocerci in muscle tissue okay so this is like a biopsy from an animal um, that where we can actually see these pearls in the muscle okay um, these larval cysts actually develop in tissues of intermediate hosts so for example pork so wild boar our own pigs things like that um, after a person ingests the pork muscle, which contains this larval worm, the scolex attaches with its four muscular suckers and its crown of hooklets, and that actually initiates the infection in the small intestine. So that's where the invasion happens. The worm then, as it develops, is going to produce proglottids until it's created a strobola, right? A chain of proglottids. The mature proglottids contain the eggs, which are then passed. So basically, you have gravid proglottids or eggs, so gravid meaning mature, that are passed. They are then somehow ingested into, um, you know, a patient. And you can actually have a couple of different ways of this working, but one way is literally the development of an oncosphere, which basically hatches, penetrates, and gets into the cell wall. And then from there, you've got the bloodstream, and from the bloodstream, it can go wherever it wants. And this is actually how cystocercosis occurs, because this oncosphere is basically what's going to allow the attachment in the intestine, which is going to allow for it to get into the bloodstream, which is really going to send it throughout the body. And that's for the brain specifically. Neurocystocercosis is kind of the one I think of the most, but we'll talk about some other ones. So where do we expect to see this? For T. solium, we see it in pork, particularly in Africa, India, Southeast Asia, China, Mexico, Latin America, and some Slavic countries, okay? Notice the United States isn't really on this list. Um, T. solium is something that our pork supply is very stringently um, kind of checked for, so we don't have to worry about it too much here. Um, T. saginata, on the other hand, though, that one's worldwide. We actually do see it in the United States. Um, humans and cattle actually perpetuate the life cycle because what happens is that human feces that have the eggs and proglottids can contaminate water and vegetation, which are then ingested by the cattle. And then the cystocerci form in the cattle, produce adult tapeworms in humans when we eat that rare hamburger. Um, that's how you can get it. If you really like rare meat, well, Welcome to tapeworms. Not definitely. I mean, we do check this sort of thing, but it's just something to keep in mind. All right, so clinical syndromes. So for T. solium, remember, this is pork. 
if a person ingests an adult T. soleum, the, it, it's normally asymptomatic. You don't really have to worry about it too much. If you develop a few cystocerci in non-vital areas, um, so by non-vital, what do I mean? Um, subcutaneous tissue, um, you might not get symptoms. But if you get the sister side to lodge in vital areas, like say the brain, lungs, um, eyes, even muscle to a degree, um, that's where we actually have significant damage. So remember, this has kind of a slightly different disease course because the hatched eggs become these oncospheres, which can in penetrate the intestinal wall and migrate through the blood to these distal sites. Particularly if we're worried about the brain, we have to worry about hydrocephalus, meningitis, cranial nerve damage, seizures, hyperactive reflex, and then if it affects the eye or the brain, visual defects. So this is actually a scan of a patient, and you can see each of these, I'm going to use a different color so you can actually see it, each of these are cystocerci. They're basically just little little larval worms that have made their way into this patient's brain. And I mean, there, there's so many of them. So obviously the inflammation here from the antiparasitic response is going to be robust. Um, so patients can have some significant and very serious and potentially life-threatening um, issues as a result of this. Okay, so what about T. saginata? Um, once again, if you swallow the adult tapeworm for some reason, normally that's asymptomatic. Um, if you have, you know, ingestion of the eggs or some mature proglottids that can reduce, produce eggs, you may see some vague abdominal pains, chronic indigestion or hunger pangs. Um, and typically with T. saginata, though, the proglottids are going to pass out of the anus directly, so it doesn't tend to be as um, severe a syndrome. All right, so how do we diagnose it? How do we treat it? Um, diagnosis, you're going to examine the stool for proglottids and eggs. That's kind of the whole deal. Um, treat it. So if you're treating like subcutaneous T. soleum or um, something that hasn't gone to kind of a systemic sister psychosis yet, um, you might use niclosamide. Um, if you're worried about sister psychosis, you're going to use prosequantil or albendazole. Um, but even better would just be to prevent it altogether, right? Um, nobody really wants to ingest tapeworms. So we can prevent it in a lot of different ways. Um, T. soleum, you're going to require the pork to be cooked till it's kind of a grayish color, so no more pink, um, or you can freeze it for at least 12 hours prior to cooking. Either of those are going to remove the parasite. T. saginata, sorry guys, if you like those rare hamburgers, well, that's not going to do it. Um, you want to cook your beef um, pretty extensively, you know, done to well done. Um, and then the main thing is also to basically stop the life cycle. So one of the best ways to do that is controlling the disposal of human feces. When we control the disposal of human feces and keep it away from our food sources, excuse me, away from, you know, vegetation that our farmed animals may eat, we actually stop ourselves from being infected. So good sanitation practice is also important.